Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the session uh, titled Elevating Your IT General Controls and Learning from Others' Mistake. Uh, today's session is going to be presented by uh, me. My name is Anurag. I'm a partner with Vidim uh, based out of our Princeton, New Jersey office. I lead our uh, system and process assurance group, uh, which is where we provide all of our services related to internal controls, uh, SOX, SOC, SOC 1, SOC 2 audits. Uh, joining me today for the session is Stephanie. Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Fitzgerald. Uh, I am also a partner in our system and process assurance group. And uh, I, I work on all the same things as Anurag that he just stated, the IT general controls as well as business process controls uh, surrounding SOC reporting, SOC 1, SOC 2, and uh, SOX reporting. Thanks. So uh, the way we have structured our session today is we are going to start with, uh, you know, taking a very broad look at the cyber landscape, right, where things are, and then try and tie it down uh, to how having some good IT general controls in place can really help you improve your security posture uh, uh, to weather some of these threats. So first and foremost, right, I, I always like to start with this. Uh, what you're seeing here is, is just a pictorial view of uh, different data breaches and if you look at a bubble, each the size of the bubble depicts uh, the number of records that were uh, breached as a part of that, right? And then each breach is identified as, sing, uh, as a single bubble. So what you're looking at right now is, you know, a representation of breaches in the year 2010 to 2014. And then uh, this is a representation of breaches uh, in the year 2020 to 2024. So if you see within a span of 10 years, uh, the volume and the size of the breaches have really uh, gone through the roof. Uh, the point is that we are seeing a very, very uh, uh, a trend of increasing the number uh, in terms of number of breaches. We are also seeing an increase uh, in the size of the breaches where now, where it used to be, you know, a thousand records that got breached here and there. We are now very consistently seeing millions of records that get compromised uh, as a part of the breach. So uh, taking a step back, well, there are real threats out there uh, for businesses that, uh, you know, uh, are trying to uh, connect with their customers, are trying to connect with the employees in the remote organization uh, setup that we have today. And these threats are real and there has to be a strategy to deal with it. So, well, the obvious question is, what has this got to do with ITGCs? So uh, before we answer that question, let's understand what do we mean when we talk about ITGCs, right? So IT general controls are is nothing but, you know, policies, procedures uh, that are implemented in your IT systems. And the objective of these are to protect and provide confidentiality to your data, maintain integrity of your data, and make sure your data is available when you need it, right? So that is a very, very simple definition of ITGC. Uh, if we take a step further, uh, what does that translate into? So uh, let's look at a few examples, right? You want to connect to your system, you put your username and password, the system needs to authenticate you before they get you in, logical access. That is an aspect of ITGC area. If you have a system that you've developed in-house, and you're making changes, code changes to the system, change management is an aspect that comes into play, right? If you have servers in your server room, in your server rack, you want a rack, you want to make sure the room stays locked, you have an access bash to get to it, physical access. Uh, you have jobs that run overnight to, to keep the operations up and running. Well, all of that would be a part of computer operations. Uh, everybody wants to make sure they have a good backup in place. Uh, and the hope is you never need to use it, but if you need to, then uh, you should be able to recover your systems. That is where data backup and recovery comes into play, right? Uh, anytime there is an incident and you need to be able to respond to the incident, uh, recover out of it, manage the whole incident, that is where incident management as an area comes into play. Uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, same thing, right? We've seen a few uh, hurricane situations in the uh, past few weeks. 
uh, anytime a part of your network, a part of your system goes down, how soon can you recover from it? Uh, how resilient is your infrastructure is all covered by the business continuity disaster recovery planning area. Uh, security awareness, right? Uh, how do you make sure that uh, you train the weakest link in an organization, which is the human being, right? How do you train your employees? How do you train your contractors, people who work in your environment? All of that gets covered under security awareness. And again, this is not a comprehensive list of ITGC areas. These are some examples uh, just to put some context to what do we mean when we use the term IT general controls. So now that we have a good understanding of IT general controls, let's try and uh, see how this would relate to some of the data breaches that we were talking about. So in the next section, I think we'll focus on uh, uh, a study and try and see what we are seeing in breaches and then see how it impacts our ITGC and how we can use ITGC to strengthen our posture there. So I think that the term data breach is a scary term, right? Um, it, it's scary in, in so many ways. It's disruptive to a company, depending on what type of data is breached, it's a scary thing. But something that we want to focus on here is the cost of a breach to a company. Um, so this slide here is kind of showing the average total cost of a data breach. So as you can see, year over year, it's continuing to increase the cost of, of a data breach. So currently, a breach will cost a company approximately $4.8 million globally, which is huge. Right. And I think these are more global stats, but... Uh... Uh, this 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 includes all sorts of costs, right? These includes costs associated with, hey, once you discover the breach, how do you recover out of it? This includes costs associated with some of the remediation action you'll have to take as a result of the breach, and that is why it's a significant number there. Another thing to take into consideration is the time it takes to identify and then contain uh, the data breach after it occurs. So if you look here, um, in 2024, we're saying that the time it takes to identify and contain a breach, the identification piece, a breach can be going on for approximately 194 days before that breach is actually identified as an issue. Uh, once that breach is identified, it could take another 64 days to actually contain that breach. Um, so I think that that's a little bit scary there, because if you look at it, 258 days in total, you know, you're looking at close to a, a year's worth of time um, between a breach occurring and then being able to remediate the, the issues and contain that breach. Correct. And this is not uncommon. Uh, you know, anecdotally, if you look at uh, a few breaches in the past, right, including the target breach, it was like months before even the company came to know uh, that they had a breach and that they were losing data. And even once they identified that, it isn't that, hey, you figured it out today, now you can uh, remediate the breach within a week. It takes time for you to identify all the points of data exfiltration, take remedial action, fix it, and, and try to keep your business up and running at the same time. So it's a huge task. This is very, very important. And this also uh, drives a point that a lot of times, companies don't even know that they are being breached. So just because you feel or you have that sense of security that I have not been breached uh, uh, doesn't mean that that might be the fact unless you get some sort of a, a, a test done, right? Uh, very often, uh, people don't even realize that they have threat actors already present inside their network who might be uh, stealing data from their network. Yeah, I, and just to close the loop, loop on that, I think that goes back to what I was talking about before about how disruptive it is, right? So you can see how disruptive that would be to the company that had the data breach, as well as to the company's customers surrounding that breach. Um, so the next thing that we wanna talk about is the cost by type of record. Um, so the cost per record depends on what type of record was compromised within the breach. So as you can see on this slide uh, at the top, the most expensive type of record would be employee PII. So when employee PII records are breached uh, within a company, that is the most expensive type of breach that can occur. So what we're showing here is the per record cost um, I think what's important to think about is it's never a breach of five records. It's never a breach of 10 records. You know, we're talking about 
hundreds of thousands, millions of records that are being breached here. So uh, when you multiply those numbers out, it comes to, you know, that high of a number that we showed on the first slide being, slide being that $4.8 million. Uh, somewhere around that range is really what you would come out to be. But we wanted to show kind of uh, a map here of from, from top to bottom exactly how much on average uh, each type of record is costing during a breach. Correct. And uh, what I would also suggest is when you look at your own systems, when you look at your own organization and, and the data that you have in your organization, right, use this information to determine the, uh, the do the risk assessment for yourself, right? Hey, if my systems were to breach, right, what is it going to cost me depending on where uh, your records lie, use that as a number to come up with uh, an estimate and a lot of times companies would use that to uh, come up with a return on investment for their security investments, right? Because uh, it's a big challenge to come up with an ROI for a security investment because, hey, you don't know till you actually get breached what it is going to cost you. And I think this is a, a good matrix to use in order to come up with that number. Yeah, I think that would be a great thing um, while a company is performing their risk assessment right in the beginning of the year to kind of take a look at that and see where their risk lies and be able to quantify that. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to take a look at here uh, within this report here is the root causes of a breach. I think we're all pretty familiar with the areas that we're seeing here, right? Um, something that we've all seen and heard of are the malicious or criminal attacks that makes up about 55% of the root causes of data breaches. Uh, if you look at the other two, uh, the, the darker blue and the lighter purple colors are IT failure and human error. Um, they're pretty much similar, uh, kind of split down the middle after you take out the malicious or criminal attacks. Um, so I think we're all also familiar with the IT, IT failure and human error. It kind of affects or can affect most organizations. Um, so I think the biggest takeaway from this slide is to highlight that ITGCs can really help here. Uh, in looking at these root causes. So strong ITGCs uh, can mitigate these types of breaches. Yeah, and you know, uh, I remember when we talk about human error, uh, there are simple things. Uh, I remember an incident where uh, there was a situation where a human resource person needed help with formatting of a spreadsheet which contained, uh, you know, a de details of their employees and their 401k investments or something like that. And a lot of the columns in the spreadsheet were hidden, uh, like collapsed and had PII in it. And she did not realize that. And she basically forwarded it to her husband saying, hey, do you mind formatting this for me without realizing that she had now sent uh, employee PII outside of the employee network boundaries and that resulted in a breach, right? That would be considered a breach, even though the exposure was limited. But uh, you're absolutely right, Steph, right? Uh, when we look at this chart, I would say the 45%, which is IT failure and human error, you can absolutely uh, manage that with ITGCs. And even on the 55%, which is an external threat, having a strong ITGC would help you improve your security posture and you provide you additional protection against that. So with that, actually, uh, let's get into uh, some of the attack vectors, right? So what you're looking at here is a chart which shows what are the most frequently used attack vectors uh, uh, for some of these breaches. Uh, and so here, if you see, you know, uh, uh, stolen credentials, phishing are uh, pretty much, you know, some of the most frequently used attack vectors. And then on, on the column side, you're seeing cost of the breach associated by attack vectors. So uh, anything in the top right column here is something that is far more frequently used and is a very expensive data breach for an organization. So I, I do want to focus on uh, you know some of these uh, because this is basically what would help us connect these to ITGCs, right? So when we uh, talk about uh, stolen credentials, we are talking about somebody getting access to your user ID password information, right? When we talk about phishing, we're talking about somebody uh, who receives an email with a malicious link, uh, tricking you into clicking on that or tricking somebody into clicking on that. When we talk about business email compromise, uh, we're talking about an attack where you get a very well-crafted email 
which may appear to be coming from a colleague of yours or from a vendor of yours, asking you to transfer money, asking you to pay an invoice, asking you to change the account information or some in, in some shape or form. Uh, again, uh, email based attack targeting a human being, right? Uh, broadly known as social engineering attacks. Uh, then we also see threat actors where system patches and vulnerabilities have not been uh, updated and that results into a breach. And then of course, if you have, if you're using cloud as a part of your infrastructure, wh whether it is AWS, Microsoft, Azure, or any of the other cloud service providers like uh, Google, uh, GCP, and if you've not configured the cloud properly, then that misconfiguration can often result into breach. So if you look at these uh, threat vectors, going back to our initial map of the ITGC, it's very easy to correlate and say, yep, uh, logical access, uh, you know, stolen credentials uh, is definitely something that maps here. Uh, any social engineering aspect would map to security awareness. Uh, computer operations and data backup, if you're not able to recover, if it was a ransomware attack through a phishing email and you're not able to recover, then this would come into play. And then, you know, vulnerabilities in your system are related to change management. So uh, the point is, when we look at the real world uh, statistics on data breaches and we peel the onion, try to do a root cause analysis, more often than not, you are able to get down to, uh, uh, things that could have been done very simply to prevent a breach, and a lot of that is related to IT general controls. So, so with that, let's talk about some of the big cases that we've seen recently, right? Uh, and I, I'm, I will be surprised if anybody on the call here is not aware about the crowd strike outage that we faced uh, a few months back, right? This was a situation where one of uh, a very widely used security software pushed out an update uh, to one of their agents. Uh, the update was not tested properly at their end, got pushed out. A lot of companies had an automated system to apply the update. It got applied, resulted in a blue screen uh, of death, right, for Windows machines. Uh, requiring a situation which could not be fixed remotely and you had to actually physically often physically be uh, there at where, uh, you know, at the device in order to be able to recover from it. And we saw wide scale outages from airlines, banks, media, all across. So uh, when you look at an incident like this and you go back and say, all right, what went wrong? What was the root cause for this? Uh, you, you then realize that, hey, this is not just one incident, right? We had a similar incident, which was related to change management, uh, looking uh, where codes change was made, was not tested, was not QC'd properly before it was applied, and that resulted in disruption. Uh, American Airlines had a situation where their whole reservation system went down, right? And I think it, there was an outage of at least a day resulting in ca numerous cancellation of flights in 2013. Uh, there was a situation uh, where a, a software glitch resulted in $450 million of loss within 45 minutes uh, for Knight Capital Group because they had a trading software, uh, you know, which was misconfigured and went on uh, conducting trades, which it wasn't supposed to. And similarly, AWS, uh, you know, uh, uh, had a big outage because of a similar situation. So, uh, all of these events, that uh, incidents that we were looking at uh, go down to a healthy change management process in an organization. So I always look at it uh, from two point of view, right? If you're an organization and you are uh, developing a piece of software that your customers are using, absolutely change management is critical because now any uh, enhancement that you make in the product if you don't test it properly and then you push it out, it can cause disruption for your customers, right? So case in point, CrowdStrike. Now, if you're not a software organization which is actually developing a product and giving it to your clients, but you are actually an organization that is using uh, software from other vendors and have some sort of a, a small piece of in-house development happening, uh, then 
even in those situations, change management is important because there are principles in change management that require you to test anything that you would apply into production environment. So, uh, you know, I know of customers who were using CrowdStrike but were not impacted uh, because of the whole situation simply because they had a robust mechanism of a phased rollout of the product in their environment. So the way they had set it up as a part of their change management process was that anytime a new update would come, they would first roll it out into a very small uh, you know, set of their uh, workstations uh, in a small test environment, observe it for a couple of days, then phase it out to not critical part of their network, test it out for a couple of days, and then in the third week, pretty much have a broader rollout. Now, that approach would give them an opportunity to identify a situation which would break the system and roll things back instead of rolling it out in one shot and then uh, dealing with the consequences, which was trying to basically build all the machines that got impacted from ground up, right? So uh, I cannot emphasize it again, uh, that change management is definitely a key area in ITGC. Uh, in, in our slide on data breaches, we saw a bunch of social engineering type of attacks, right? Uh, these come in all shapes or forms. Phishing via email is most common. Uh, business email compromise we already saw. Smishing is SMS, right? And we get this every day now. You will get text messages from, Apple keeps on sending me messages every day saying, hey, do you know, I should go and authenticate myself and change my iCloud account. I know that's a, uh, you know, a fake, message and I would never click on it, but there are people who would fall for it and that is called a smishing attack. And then wishing is basically you getting a phone call and somebody trying to get information from you over voice these days. And with uh, advancements in AI technology, this is really becoming very, very uh, 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 significant attack vector. So when we look at attacks like these, right, again, there are real life examples, right? Uh, a situation with ubiquity networks, uh, CEO was traveling, uh, a part of an acquisition was happening. Uh, somebody in the, uh, I think the CFO or the chief accounting officer got an email saying, hey, go ahead and uh, transfer $46.7 million as a result of that acquisition, all because somebody sitting outside knew the dynamics happening there and was able to leverage that to send that email at the right time to the right person. and. Uh, $46 million got transferred out of uh, their accounts. They were able to recover a part of this back, but it was a very painful process. Uh, another example was Sony Pictures. Started as a phishing email, they got access to data, and then that data was uh, pretty much utilized to you know, release a lot of uh, emails, uh, confidential emails uh, to public, as well as uh, movies and movie related details to public, which resulted in uh, millions of dollars of uh, impact for them. And then uh, the whole Hillary Clinton uh, and the DNC email was again started with a phishing email and resulted had you know huge political repercussions. So we see all of these uh, examples and I'm sure you've come across uh, your own uh, set of examples there. Uh, but if I go back to ITGC map, this is security awareness training. This is making sure you're training your employees and making sure you're putting in some common sense, logical access controls in place. If, uh, if your organization is set up where somebody gets access to your username and password and that is good enough for them to go and access your data, then you're not set up right. In today's day and age, multi-factor authentication is something that is expected. It is assumed that somebody would get access to your username and password, so it's very important that you now think of what else. How can you make it more difficult? What other methods of authentication should be implemented? And that is where logical access comes into play, and that should be used in order to strengthen your uh, overall ITGC area. So uh, I think the conclusion of some of the examples that we saw is that uh, even though we look at high profile breaches in the news, it all comes down to uh, you know, uh, basic IT general controls area and making sure uh, that we have coverage for those. So, and, and uh, to that point, that, to that point, Anurag, 
um, just to, since you just said that the high level breach is there, um, everyone should probably realize that, you know, these phishing things, like you said, even we get them, everyone gets them. Um, no matter the size of your company, you, you need to be aware of these things and you need to be implementing those internal uh, IT general controls to really mitigate those uh, risks related to the data breaches. So even though we're kind of putting out there the larger uh, breaches, just everyone should really be aware that it, they don't discriminate. Absolutely, I agree with that. So, so with that, let's just run down through some of the key takeaways from our session today, right? Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's always important to learn from industry best practices. Uh, you know, there are standard uh, information available uh, and learn from others' mistakes. And I think that's the topic of our session here. Uh, whenever you come across uh, a news about a breach, always try to uh, follow up and see what was the root cause and then go back into your environment and see, is that something that can happen to you? And if it can, what can you do to fix it, right? I think that thought process, that mentality can really help you keep, uh, uh, improve your security posture. Uh, the second key takeaway is, is uh, the whole culture of security uh, uh, actually comes from tone at the top and leadership commitment is very, very important in these situations. So uh, look at your organization and see, hey, do we have that kind of a corporate buy-in? Do we have the leadership commitment to make sure that uh, security can be made one of the priorities for our organization? And if you do, then that would definitely reflect in your security posture. Uh, access controls, strengthening access controls, that's a no-brainer. You should, uh, if you're using cloud, if you're using a web-based application, it is very important that you have multi-factor authentication, very easy, not, not expensive to implement, but have those technologies in place to make it, uh, you know, really uh, easy for your employees to be able to work in a remote environment, but at the same time, not compromise security. Uh, I cannot overemphasize change management. Uh, as I said, it's not important only if you are developing a product, even if you are just a user of a software, there are aspects of change management that are very, very critical and every organization should implement uh, uh, basic control surrounding that. Uh, educating and training your employees, right? Remember, human being is the weakest link when it comes to a security uh, situation. So investment in security awareness training for your employees would go a very long way uh, in terms of improving your security posture. And, and last but not the least, right? When was the last time you got a health check done? Uh, if you didn't, well, it's never too late to start. You don't know what you don't know. So it's always important to get some sort of an ITGC health check done uh, every year from uh, you know some independent company so that they can come and tell you the things that you are missing and where you can invest your uh, security dollars in order to actually move the needle and make your environment more secure. And with that, I think we come to an end of our session today. Uh, thank you for your time. And we hope uh, you get a few good takeaways from our session today to implement. Thank you.